everybody. Welcome to the Museum of Latin American Arts 2021 Afro Latinx Festival. My name is Simone Moffitt. I am the graphic designer here at MOLA. And on behalf of the rest of the staff, I'd like to thank you for joining us today as we learn more about the diversity of Afro Latinx experiences and dive into the history of the African legacy throughout Latin America. Before we begin, I would like to thank the event sponsor that made this 10-day event possible and accessible. Please enjoy the short message from our presenting sponsor, the Port of Long Beach. Hola, I'm Mario Cordero. Welcome to the Museum of Latin American Arts 2021 Afro-Latinx Festival. We are pleased to sponsor this event that highlights the rich diversity in our community. Throughout our history, the Port of Long Beach has long been a supporter of education, the arts, and community efforts that amplify and deepen the understanding of our cultural tapestry and impact. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope you enjoy this exploration of the African influence in Latin America and Latinx culture. Felicidades. El Museo de Latin American Art. Muchas gracias por esta oportunidad. MOLA receives additional support from the Robert Gumbiner Foundation, the City of Long Beach, and the Arts Council of Long Beach. Tonight's event is hosted by and moderated by Tasha W. Hunter. Tasha is a California born and based filmmaker, event planner, educator, and writer. Over the past two decades, she has worked in a variety of professional capacities centered around the community, arts, and education in both the private and public sectors. She is an avid world traveler and researcher focusing her studies on the African diaspora and cross-culture experiences and com commonalities. Tasha is the co-founder of Wiggins Hunter Consulting Group and is currently a cultural heritage commissioner for the city of Long Beach, a founding board member and VP of the African American Cultural Center of Long Beach and past president of the Arts Council for Long Beach. She is the proud mother to three amazing children, Asia, Mo, and Kai. We hope you enjoy tonight's program. Great, right. thank you so much. Welcome, everyone. Bienvenidos, bonnoichi, and good evening to all. This is a very exciting event. And I want to say that um, I love the Afro Latinx Festival here at MOLA. I, last year, I was there in person and met so many amazing people. So many amazing people. I made, a, made amazing food delicious food that just brought back so many memories, um, memories of the places that I've traveled. And I got to dance, we danced. We did a lot of dancing to soca and salsa, merengue and samba. And it just made me say, yo tenho muito saudade de Brazil. I miss Brazil so much. And yo tenho muito saudade de Gingy. I miss so many people, that's Portuguese. Um, I will say I'm very happy to be here with you all today and happy that we're able to partner with um, MOLA as we navigate in this new space in this new world. Um, and I wanna say in, in our ancient African and indigenous tradition, I'd like to ask any elders in the audience if we do have your permission to new, move forward with tonight's event. I guess in this new tradition of this new forum, if you can type it in the chat, We'd like to ask for your permission to move forward. All righty, thank you for that. Ashe. So in a few minutes, I wanna share the whole thought process behind this event. Um, but first I wanted to say that um, we are a new organization, the African American Cultural Center of Long Beach and exciting things are happening with our organization. And uh, we have a temporary location and we have monthly community roundtables and more, but I'd like to take a moment to introduce Ms. Phaedra Allen, who is our program committee chair. She's gonna share some words about the AACCLB and some of the things that we do. Welcome, Phaedra. Hey, greetings, hello everyone. Can everyone 
hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? No? Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. It's a little low, but while Phaedra is getting her um, sound. Okay, is that better? That's a lot better. I tell you, this, this Zoom technology is always something. So greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Phaedra Allen. Um, thank you, Tasha, for the introduction. I um, am a member of the African American Cultural Center here in Long Beach, and as she shared, I have the honor of serving as the chair of the programming committee um, and I say an honor because really this is passion work. Um, you know, we are a board of very excited community members who volunteer to really bring this community center or this cultural center forward to serve as a linkage in our community, a hub of African-American culture and activity, a place where people can learn, educate themselves more about the African-American culture and tradition, and also a touchstone for um, for, for the African American community here in Long Beach so that we can gather and connect with one another. So um, I just wanna acknowledge the board who um, I'm sure here in the room as well. We are excited about tonight's discussion. And um, I do, I invite you all to stay connected with us. As Tasha shared, we have monthly activities and um, soon we're gonna be hosting a virtual exhibit um, of Forgotten Images, which we are very, very excited for. So we do hope um, that you will stay connected and look forward to seeing you soon. And hand that back over to Tasha. Well, you're muted. There we go. Um, thank you, Phaedra. And once again, visit us at aacclb.org, sign up for our newsletter, and hear about all of our exciting events that are taking place. So. The whole concept behind this, I heard something that was um, a little disturbing. As a transplant to Long Beach, um, this is the place I call home, I recently heard the black and brown community does not get along here in Long Beach. And that jolted me. Um, and in true fashion, I started asking around and the first person I called was Griselda, Griselda Suarez, who I'm gonna introduce you to, but you probably already know. And I called one of my elders and then I called some neighborhood folks, fourth generation Long Beach people. And some of them confirmed that. So when it was time to do this event with MOLA, um, again, this is the conversation that I proposed. It's a, it's a intriguing conversation. It's a intentional conversation. It's an important conversation. Um, and I will say to that, the black and brown community don't get along. It's time to change the narrative. It's time to change our relationships. Um, people are watching and listening at this point in time, right here, right now. So what better time than now? With that being said, she needs no introduction, um, but she has been a true advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And you all may have seen the, the equity poster where there's the people standing outside of a, of, a, of a field, of a stadium. I think it's a baseball game. And they're at different levels. And then there's a picture that shows, okay, give everybody the box so that they all can see into the stadium, right? And we were looking at this. I was looking at this with Griselda. And she was like, you know what? That photo's cool, that's good for equity. She said, but I wanna see all those people inside of that stadium enjoying that game. So that's the, that's the Griselda I know. Um, and with that, she is a writer, artist, cook, and teacher. She was born in unincorporated East Los Angeles and believes that the arts are essential in empowering others to express their thoughts. Throughout her career, she has created programs, a programming and teaching dedicated and training dedicated to facilitating transformation and creating agency for her community. In 2016, she became the executive director of the Arts Council for Long Beach. Most recently, Griselda was awarded 40 
um, under 40 by the Long Beach Post for her leadership in the arts and her resilience in battling cancer. Suarez is dedicated to Long Beach and loves contributing to the city because she strongly believes in the impact of local, um, the local artists has on residents' lives. Griselda Suarez. Buenas noches, everybody. Thank you for including me in this conversation, Tasha, and wanting me to contribute to the brainstorm and the community thought here. Um, I also just want to take a moment um, and recognize that um, I live and work on traditional and sacred lands of Tongva, Kich, Achiman, and Shumash, and many other indigenous groups that call today these uh, grounds and lands home. Um, I honor and extend my gratitude to all the original people still living today and contributing their lives to uh, this region. I, um, I, with Tasha and many other folks in the community think that there are many bridges um, yet to be um, uh, built. <laughs> And uh, I think many of us are uh, here today to learn about that and to engage. And I wanna say thank you to our panelists who have decided to uh, join us in this journey. Um, and I'm proud to you know, uh, have one of our grantees from the Arts Council, Ryan Hoyle, um, give his story, present his storytelling, and also um, one of our grantees and also former board members, Gloria Arjona, here. And I think um, there is a spectrum that many of us um, live through, right, that have lived through in our families um, and have never brought forward. And behind me tonight is one of my favorite um, uh, images that I love from the revolutionary from the revolution um, by uh, Agustin Casasola. And what I love about this um, is that it reminds me of several things. One, this photo is a person from Michoacan, which is my um, father's homeland. And um, between what you see in me and this unknown person, because we don't know who it was, um, you see my entire family. My family is all of this. Um, in Michoacan, we come in all of these uh, faces and, and shades. And so I just wanted to bring here, here, bring them here. Because the other thing we don't know is um, in the revolution, there were many people who were queer, butch identified or, or transgender, and we don't know. But I just wanted to bring them here tonight and, and thank you again for including me. Thank you, Griselda. Um, at this time, we wanted to um, share some community rules. As we move through this process, um, through this evening, we just wanna make sure that we are um, staying on topic and they're in the chat as well. So thank you for um, including those in the chat. We wanna make sure that we're holding each other accountable. We're listening for understanding acknowledge our own privilege within the intersections of races, ages, ableist, sexist, misogynistic, homophobic, and transphobic society. Recognize the space we take up and or hold because of this privilege. Center the voices of Black people, Indigenous people, and the people of color that choose to share in this space. Let's own our mistakes, own your mistakes, your intentions, and your impacts respect each other's experiences and honor confidentiality, speak honestly and from your own experiences, appreciate silence and processing time. Share the space, allow others to finish before you speak, be present, exercise self-care. It is okay to disagree. Check hierarchy at the door and value the voices of every member equally. Speak from personal experiences using I, statements. And with that, I want to um, thank you all once again for being present and for being here. Um, thank you for supporting our vision. Hey, Griselda, so let, let's talk about the importance of telling our stories. Uh, 
Well, um, I've storytelling uh, in many ways for me as a writer, um, as a poet is, is about exerting our breath from our body onto our community. And, um, you know, this, this, this last year um, has really, that has really impacted me um, because after um, my lifetime and many lifetimes of, of holding our breaths or not being able to express that has come to a point where we can no longer, right, exist that way. Um, and so for me, you know, as I shared with you, uh, it was really important to be able to exercise that storytelling, that breath, and, and that many of our stories live on because of oral tradition. Right, and that's one of those commonalities that we are going to talk about later on as well in our African tradition, you know, we have our griots and we don't have written stories in many times and um, and we learn we wonder why our elders will repeat the same things over and over again. I used to say, you know, Granny Ma, you, you said you told me that story already. And now that Granny Ma is an ancestor, I realize that that's part of the oral tradition of um, me remembering and rehearing those stories so that we can pass them on down to our um, next generations. So we have an exciting um, group of panelists that are gonna be here today. You know, I'm gonna call them storytellers. Our storytellers that are here and just a quick layout of how the day is gonna go, um, how the evening is gonna go. We're gonna have our storytellers tell their stories um, they are within our Afro-Latinx community. Um, Ryan Hoyle, Regina Bassel, and Dr. Gloria Arjona. And um, yeah, we're gonna tell you a little bit about them. Griselda? I think our first panelist is Ryan. Uh oh, you're still muted, but um, let me let me introduce Ryan. Ryan is a Long Beach native and um, multi hyphenate creative using his gifts to develop and foster positive lasting change in communities of color. As an adjunct professor and founder of Play Nice Long Beach, his passion lies in bridging the gap between education and outcomes in creative professions and industries. So at this time, I want to pass this over to Ryan. Welcome, Ryan. We're so happy to have you here. I appreciate it. Thanks for the intro um, and to all the attendees and guests. Um, thank you so much for being a part um, of this, this programming. Um, thank you to MOLA, the Arts Council, and the Port of Long Beach for uh, sponsoring such critical work um, and really just, um, you know, taking a stance on uh, creating a community that's uh, more racially aware. Um, also happy Black History Month. Um, I feel like um, this intersection and um, having this programming during this month is something that's um, equally important to have. Um, just to get started, I see uh, some familiar names in um, the list of attendees, but uh, for those who don't know me, um, my name is Ryan Hoyle. I am a Long Beach native, um, born in Los Angeles, raised in Long Beach, um, a product of the Long Beach Unified School District, um, graduated from Poly High School, uh, went on to uh, study communications and marketing at California State University, Long Beach, um, and then eventually got my master's in counseling from LMU. Um, that led me to uh, picking up positions, uh, interning, and leading me to uh, becoming an adjunct professor um, at Southwest College, where I teach um, counseling, introductory counseling classes. Um, I also am the co-owner and founder of Play Nice Long Beach, which is um, a community hub, community resource center, art gallery, um, vintage retail spot, all in one. Um, essentially, we create space for black and brown youth to uh, creatively express themselves, whether that be via pop-up shops, programming, financial literacy, uh, seminars, voter registration drives, things of that nature. Um, but we are the, the I'd like to say the voice of, uh, of young black and brown Long Beach. Um, I really, we, me and my business partners took it upon ourselves to uh, create that space um, just out of the need for um, black and brown youth to uh, have relatable role models um, and not these robots, you know, and people that they can't really relate to. Um, 
And yeah, essentially that's why I do what I do. Um, as a black American and someone who identifies um, as a black American uh, of Garifuna descent, um, for those of you that don't know, um, the Garifuna people are Afro-Indigenous people, um, an ethnic group um, based in Honduras um, and other Central American countries. Um, and this is a really unique opportunity for me as well as someone that's um, learning in public and learning more about my heritage. Um, it's a, I'm really eager to share uh, my art and experience as I continue to learn more about um, the culture as this has been a part of my identity that I, I haven't known much for uh, much about for um, a large part of, part of my life. So i um, really excited to share with you all um, some of the work um, that I've been doing and, and researching. Um, Today I'll be sharing with you guys an excerpt uh, from a project that I've um, been currently developing. Uh, it goes by the name of Rememory. Um, this project um, basically is a community-driven digital archiving experience that uses photography to actively document and preserve history. Um, the project Rememory is uh, largely inspired by the work of Toni Morrison and her novel Beloved, uh, where she coined the term Rememory um, and she pretty much used it in the novel um, as a tool for self-discovery through reliving a memory, thus rememory. Um, I really feel that photos and uh, photographs, photography um, is as much of a visual connection to our past um, as it is to our present and future. And, you know, just being able to uh, relive certain moments and highlight, you know, folks that um, might be pictured in certain photographs that might have had an impact or um, lasting impression on you. Um, there's power in that. And uh, through this project, I really um, aim to kind of relive some of these experiences. Um, the Rememory Project pre-COVID um, was supposed to be an event that uh, took place at Play Nice, where um, attendees will be given the opportunity to come in, scan a photo uh, that meant something to them. Um, and then there's a creative writing component where um, attendees will write out, you know, what, what was going on in the photo, how they felt, um, any type of emotions or feelings that were connected to that photograph. Um, and then they'd be able to, uh, to scan it and, and actually compile a book um, that kind of makes up the community. So uh, still working on that and working the kinks out on that. Um, but essentially the power is in uh, reclaiming ownership uh, of these narratives and of these images. Um, a lot of times, you know, you hear it all the time. If you don't tell your story, um, you'll allow someone else to tell it. Uh, so we want to take that power back and reclaim these images and, uh, and really get the information out there. Um, to create a society that, um, you know, is more racially aware and, you know, in tune with um, a lot of the stories and narratives of the people that make up the community. Um, this is really an uh, ethnographic approach to research and documenting, um, again, meant to highlight um, and reflect on the people, places, uh, memories and moments that have shaped our individual experiences. Um, so I'm going to open it up and share my screen really quickly. So um, in, the, in the spirit of the name, uh, Decolores, um, I actually did a color palette to go along with uh, the photos. These are all photos that I've taken um, while spending time in Honduras. So um, I'll pretty much mimic how I imagine the project Rememory going. Um, so this is a photo of my grandmother. Um, I titled it Granny. Um, this is her in the village of Manali in Honduras, coastal indigenous lands. Um, you know, my grandmother touting a smile. Uh, this is how I usually see her and how she greets me. Um, looking at the photo now, um, it really just uh, evokes memories of, of growing up and having my grandma be in Honduras for six months out of the year. And, you know, growing up as a child, you know, it's like, oh, gran granny's gone, you know, or granny's coming back, but we never really knew what was going on. Um, in Honduras while she was away. So to be, to, to be able to experience her uh, homeland and uh, ancestral lands with her um, was, was an amazing experience and uh, something that I'll cherish forever. Um, moving along, um, this is a soccer field uh, also in the village of Manali where uh, my late grandfather uh, lived at. Um, this is actually right outside of his home. And um, I just think of all of the, the time spent here with the youth in the village, um, playing soccer, being young and active. Um, 
I really remember uh, my grandfather always speaking about um, having a peace of mind and how relaxing um, being in the village was and, you know, um, in an area where, you know, there's no paved roads, uh, electricity comes from generators, things of that nature, um, just really highlighting the simple things. Um, so just this imagery, this imagery uh, brings about like feelings of uh, feelings of peace and relaxation uh, inspired by my late grandfather. Um, this one is Nitu's house. Um, I mean, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I apologize. We're, we're not seeing the other images. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, were you able to see the first one? Ryan, were you sharing a specific window or your entire um, desktop? I believe it's the entire desktop, but let me. We can see a preview, like open of, of the first photo, but nothing else. Okay. Background's good. white. Okay, me too. That's the house. There's a person standing in the front. Yes. Okay. All right. When I, I enter full screen mode from the PDF. I think that's where it causes the issue. Um, I'm going to try it again and see if if it works. OK, I'll just go from here. Um, I think it's an issue with the full screen. Um, are you able to see it? Yes. OK, um, so this one is titled uh, Nitu's House. Uh, Nitu in the native language, Garifanas, uh, is older sister. Um, this is the home of my grandmother's uh, late older sister, uh, Nitu. Um, this is where we would spend most of our time, um, really feelings of uh, breakfast, uh, chickens and roosters uh, roaming free. And uh, really just this, this photo encapsulates um, the rawness of uh, life in Manjali. Um, again, back to the idea of peace of mind and um, really just the essentials. Um, I think this uh, really uh, highlights that. Um, and here's a photo of Nitu who passed away last year. Um, again, this is my grandmother's older sister, um, really a strong woman, um, amazing memory. Um, although she didn't speak English and I don't speak Spanish, um, I felt like we were still able to uh, communicate via family members and, um, you know, she had all of the photo books and would, you know, point to photos of, of me and my siblings as, as youngsters. So um, just always great memories when I think of her. Um, this is a photo that I took uh, last December. Um, this group of women um, is known as Club 06. Um, they are um, care cultural caretakers. Um, essentially what they do is they um, make sure that folks in the village uh, are kept aware and uh, reminded of cultural practices um, and rituals and, and things of that, uh, things of that nature, traditions and such. Um, so this was actually around Christmas time and they were um, it, at Nitu's house um, doing dances and singing traditional songs and native songs. Um, very interesting experience to say the least. Uh, this is a photo that I took um, of one of the Garifuna youth uh, who goes by Rory. Um, I think that it was just so fascinating for him to see, uh, you know, the technology and to be able to, um, you know, have a photo taken of himself um, in places like this where, you know, uh, technology isn't the number one priority. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's important to see yourself, you know? So I remember taking this photo and just seeing the joy and seeing his face light up and him being able to see it, not even, developed or on a computer screen, but literally on the camera itself. So um, this is just an amazing experience as well. Um, and really get to see how rich the colors are and uh, again, the raw elements of, of life in the village. Uh, this is a photo I took of another Gotti from the youth, uh, goes by Kendi. Um, this photo was pretty cool to take. Um, it actually was getting pretty dark and um, she noticed that I took a photo of Rory and she kept insisting um, that I take a photo of her as well. Um, so that was pretty fun. Um, a memory that I have with Kendi is um, sitting on the porch um, of the house and, um, you know, me, me speaking English, not speaking the native language and not being fluent in Spanish. 
um, it was really interesting to see the dynamic of um, Kendi, who was fluent in the native language and in Spanish, but was yearning to learn English. So um, we were participating in a little, um, you know, educational um, workshop, so to speak, uh, where she was translating uh, certain words and asking for the English translation. So she was, you know, really trying desperately to learn English while teaching us um, Garifuna and Spanish, uh, which was a very interesting exchange. Um, this is Hilber. Um, this is a, almost like an uncle figure. Um, he's a math teacher in the village, uh, handyman, and uh, just all around good guy. Um, when we go and visit, um, you know, he's the one, the, the muscle essentially, um, and just learning a little bit about his story and his experience uh, definitely helped kind of put some things in perspective in terms of, um, you know, living in the village and uh, some of the history and the historical context that come along with it. Um, next uh, and last closing uh, is a photo that I took um, in another village um, called Sangralaya. Um, I think the thing that stands out the most about uh, this photo and this trip was that um, I actually went um, and was accompanied uh, by my brother who actually spent a year living uh, in Honduras um, as a cultural immersion uh, project um, from a fellowship that he received. And, uh, you know, just getting the, the tour from him and being able to experience, you know, how he was living for that year uh, was really an amazing experience. Um, Obviously, you see the two youth uh, that are walking down the road. Um, it just felt right, um, and I, for me, it symbolizes you know me and my and my brother uh, on that journey and on that trip uh, to understanding you know more about our identities and our culture. Um, I think that's the last one that I have, and um, I'll turn it back over. Thank you. Brian, thank you for sharing your story um, and your photos. It's beautiful to see places that some of us may have never been and, and hear those stories and of, of family. Appreciate the opportunity. And that's what um, tonight is all about. We're telling stories, we're sharing stories. And the first portion of this, we're gonna hear stories um, we heard Ryan's story. We'll hear Ms. Gracina Basile's story and then Dr. Gloria Arjona, we'll hear her story. And then we're gonna turn it over to our community here. Well, you'll have the opportunity to share your stories. Um, depending on the number of people that wanna share, we'd like to you know, give you four minutes, four minutes to talk. This is our, our this is one of the many of um, first steps. So next up, I'd like to introduce, actually Griselda, would you like to introduce Ms. Christina? Go right ahead, Tasha. Okay. So, Christina Basile is the founder of Azuka Negra Productions, an event production company that focuses on exposing the community to the diversity that exists among African Black culture. She was inspired to create this company because as a first generation American, product of a Belizean father and a Salvadorian mother, she did not see enough Afro-Latinidad represented in the media or in her surrounding community. She was raised in Southern California and later moved to the Bay Area to attend uh, San Francisco State University by way of Long Beach City College, which is where I met her as one of my students in a program. Um, she obtained her bachelor's of science in business administration with a concentration in management. She was heavily involved with multiple student organizations during her academic career and continues her work in community organizing through original black print and organization geared towards holistically transforming the material conditions of African black people. I'd like to introduce you all to Miss Bachina Basile. Thank Welcome. you. Thank you, Tasha, for that lovely intro. Thank you, um, everyone who took time out to be here today. Um, thank you to our host, um, 
and everyone who contributed to this event. I'm really excited to be here and sharing my story with you all. Um, it's not often that um, the narratives of Afro-Latinos um, are shown, showcased, you know, when it comes to um, the Latinx community. So to be a part of something like this, uh, I was really excited when Tasha called me. Um, so I'm going to just share just a picture, just a visual to, to go with, with some of this to give you some insight. Um, so like Tasha mentioned, um, my name is Berechina. I am Afro-Latina. Um, my father was born in Belize and my mother was born in El Salvador. I grew up all over Southern California, Alvarado, Linwood, Compton, Long Beach. Um, but Long Beach is what I call home. I graduated from Long Beach Poly High and then I attended LBCC. Um, and there I did a lot of community organizing work for um, the black students on campus. Um, and then I transferred to San Francisco State University um, where I obtained my, my bachelor degree. Um, I currently now work for Kaiser Permanente Educational Theater um, in Northern California as a community health liaison. Um, I started Azucar Negra Productions in 2019 um, to help educate people about the diversity that exists within um, African and Black communities. After years of having to explain my background and answer questions from um, Latinx, my Latinx community and other communities such as, why do you speak Spanish? I realized that a common pattern amongst Californians um, is that they have not been, they had not been exposed to Afro Latinos. Um, and if they were, it certainly wasn't someone of my complexion um, with my kinky curly hair. So I'm honored to be here and to be a part of this conversation because um, I have always existed in between these two cultures. Um, but I do consider myself multicultural because I grew up with my Belizean culture um, where I was exposed to delicious foods like fried jacks, sere, um, and rompopo. Um, but I predominantly grew up with my Salvadorian culture. Um, from my mother, where she, you know, talked a lot about uh, just her experiences growing up in El Salvador and some of the things that uh, she endured firsthand, some of the atrocities that were committed there um, during the time that the Civil War was taking place from the 19, 1980s to about 1992. So um, my mother fled here to seek refugee from the violence that was taking place in her native land. Um, and so after two attempts of cro trying to cross the border, she finally made it here on her third attempt, three's a charm. Um, and uh, that is uh, how my father and her met in, in LA. Um, when I was younger, I would remember, I remember my mother taking us to the pupuserias, um, which is the restaurants that um, on the weekends so she can get a taste of her, her native home and also feed the hungry bellies of five hungry children. Um, we would eat pupusas revueltas, um, pupusas de loroco, um, chicharrones with yuca and semita for dessert. Since I could remember, every time we went out, people constantly question my mother's relation to my black siblings and I. Are those your kids? They'd always ask her. And I was always so confused. It wasn't until I learned about race that I finally understood why they asked her those questions. But that being said, I would like to share an excerpt from my autobiography that I am currently writing. It was the first day of first grade and I had been placed in an ESL class, being that Spanish is my first language. 
the bell rang and all my classmates ran outside for recess. I looked around and saw that cliques had already been formed. As I observed the field looking for a clique to join, I saw two of my classmates bouncing a ball and I figured, hey, it's worth a shot. Let me go say hello. I walked over and in Spanish, I said, hi, my name's Prashina. Can I play with you guys? The shorter one looked at me disgusted and responded, no, as if I had insulted her. I proceeded to ask, why not? Because you're black, she responded. Who cares? I speak Spanish just like you. I said, confidently thinking that she would have to accept my offer because we share a common trait. Hablamos de Espanol. But look at the color of your skin, she responded with so much anger in her voice. I looked down at my hands and realized that she was right. My complexion was much darker than hers. As a matter of fact, it was darker than all of my classmates. I reflected on my family and their complexions, and it dawned on me that I was the darkest one of my siblings, but how come they never seemed to care? That was the moment that I realized I was Black. That was the moment that I was introduced to race. It had never been brought to my attention by my parents before, or anyone else for that matter. I felt a bit betrayed because my anti-Black classmate was telling me the truth, but my parents failed to mention it to me. That particular situation is what ignited my journey of anti-Blackness. In my five-year-old brain, I had equated my Blackness to being unworthy, a sin, and a problem. I spent the rest of my days at Lindbergh Elementary in Linwood, in isolation. No one talked to me. No one wanted to play with me. Staff and teachers treated me differently than the rest of my peers. And the only person that I felt had my back was my big sister, Dirce, who is a full Salvadorian chingona. There were many occasions I recall where she would find me crying in the playground and she'd ask me, what's wrong? Why are you crying? Who did it? Then she dragged me by my arm and demanded that I point out the bully. When she would find out who it was, she'd walk over to them, grab them by the shirt, and start yelling in her face. Next time you mess with my sister, I'm gonna beat you up. That often kept the bullies away. But as soon as they became frustrated, I was always the first person on the top of their list that they would want to pick on. I spent many days following the cool clique of girls around the playground who would only acknowledge me when I had snacks. As soon as they devoured my bag of hot Cheetos, they would look at me and say, do you have more? If I said no, they would end our temporary friendship until I returned with more treats. And sadly, I'd fall for their truce to be friends over and over again. One particular girl, we'll call her Teresa, was the only one who seemed to show any sign of sympathy. She agreed to be my friend, but only if I kept it a secret. I couldn't tell the other kids about our secret friendship. And as desperate as I was for friends, I agreed to any and all of her, her terms as long as she acknowledged my existence. I considered her my best friend because the sad reality was that she was my only friend. I began to form friendships with the kids in a special ed class next door. They never seemed to mind that I was black and I didn't seem to mind that they were different. They never brought up my race and I never mentioned their disability. It was a genuine act of acceptance on both ends that would often lead to my daily dose of wanted social engagement on the playground. So that concludes the, the excerpt. Um, I was five years old when this experience happened and started. Um, 
And although these experiences created a lot of sadness and confusion um, and anger in my life, it also contributes to the incredible woman that I am today. These experiences taught me how to be solution oriented, confident, and to be a go-getter. These experiences taught me the value of speaking up for myself and for those who are unable to speak up for themselves. To be, to be Afro-Latina is to recognize that we are African before we are anything else. Latinidad is not the way you look, but it's in the language that you speak, the food that you eat, the music that you listen to, the traditions that are passed down. Latinidad is not a race, it's a practiced culture. I would like to end um, my section with a poem that I wrote. Um, and it starts off with a quote uh, that, that I read one time and it inspired me to write the poem because I just could relate to the quote so much. So I'll start with the quote and then uh, my response is, is the poem. And just a uh, heads up, this poem is in, it has Spanish in it, it's in English and Spanish. And I'm just gonna keep it in how it is. But how can you be Latina? You don't even look like the women in the telenovelas. Honey, we are more diverse than the media portrays. We do not have one look. We come in many different shades. Piel de caramelo, piel color de café, piel oscura, piel clara, y piel color de miel. Our skin may be a contradiction of what society believes, but our job is not to change the way that we are perceived. However, it is our duty to educate those who are unaware that the African diaspora is the reasons why Blacks live everywhere. So please, don't look so shocked the next time you hear me speak Spanish. Or please, don't stare at me like I'm from a different planet. I am a Black Latina. Soy una negra bella. Y a mí me vale si la sociedad no me cree. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Rashina. Um, that was emotional. That was very emotional. And just looking at the chat, I have to stop looking for a while because, you know, but those experiences and those stories that you tell from children's perspective um, and able to remember those stories and write about those stories are really powerful because I know that so many people have very similar experiences. 